Okay, so today we're going to talk about passage planning. It is a huge subject. Um, so I've kept it quite quite short. So if you've got lots of if you've got lots of questions, I could we could do you know think about doing another session that would go on from this. But this is really just a, li um, a little introduction, um, and it's based on going out today. Um, the tide and the wind uh, and the weather um, conditions. I've done some calculations in the background and made some, uh, some assumptions. Um, so as long as you are happy to go out in 25 knots today, we are good to go. <laughs> so in terms of passage planning, there are, there's one thing really to remember overall, which is there are some regulations that are called SOLAS-5, Safety of Life at Sea. And there's a requirement if you go out to sea that you do um, some kind of passage plan. It can be on the back of a flag packet, um, or it can be, you know, in your GPS and 20 pages long. However, you like to do it, but you need to be able to show that you've done a plan for your journey, and that applies to pleasure craft as well as to commercial craft. So it's mainly for your safety, um, and also to make sure if you got into trouble that someone will be able to find you quickly. And as part of that passive plan, there are sort of three things that you need to look at. The environment, so whereabouts you're going, um, you know, is it off cliffs, very exposed, um, the boat that you're going to take, and how you would actually navigate your journey. So those are the three things that I'm going to cover. Stop me if anyone's got any questions. So the first thing is the environment. Now, the environment that we've chosen today is from Brightling Sea to West Mersey, and hopefully you've all got the little charts and things that I sent in advance. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the Thames Estuary on the east coast of the UK. Um, and a few things here that I picked out in terms of the environment is that there's mud, lots of it. So there are lots of what's called drying heights, which is where um, the bottom of the sea almost is above the height of the water. So you're quite reliant on the tide coming in to cover that so that you can sail uh, past those lumps in the seabed. It's very sheltered. So whilst we've chosen to go out to sea today, if you decided you didn't want to go out in your 25 knots, you could turn right at the end of the river instead of left and um, potter about in lots of backwaters. So there's lots of alternatives on, on the day. The tidal range is about four meters. So that means in any 12 hour period, four meters of tide comes in and four meters of tide goes out. Um, and the other thing you need to do for your environment is to make sure you get a really good weather forecast, particularly when you're going out to sea, because often the conditions out at sea will be a little bit different to the conditions in land. So make sure you've got a really good weather forecast from several sources and make sure you, that stays current. So that's in terms of the environment. Um, and then some pictures here of Brightling Sea itself. I just wanted to show you some of the differences with the tides. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see this picture here of a lovely anchor, which is on the hard. Um, and then ordinarily you can go and have a picnic beside that and enjoy looking out at the lovely boats. You can see it's quite dry here. But sometimes um, on a spring tide, this is particularly with a surge, this is a couple of days ago, uh, the water comes right up. Um, over the anchor and the same in the other picture as well this white bollard actually uh, the screen side of the white bollard are some benches and you'll see the tops of those benches just here um, so just be aware that what what if you've been to somewhere and you think oh this would be a really nice place to come and sail just be aware that the tide can make it look quite different on a different day and then there's another picture here of um Landmarks are quite helpful when you're um, cruising. So um, at Brightling Sea, there is a landmark called Bateman's Tower, which is this um, tower here. And you can see on a, this photograph on the left-hand side, uh, when the tide was out, all the groins are exposed, the beach is quite exposed. You can see quite a lot of mud. Um, and then the other day, when there was a spring tide and the tidal surge, it was the water was completely up to the beach huts. Let's get rid of this. Can everyone see that? So can, Brightling Sea can be quite exciting. 
So I did some calculations for you today. The other thing you need to be careful of is making sure that you know what, what the tide is on the place that you're leaving from and also the place that you're going to. So I've done some calculations in the background um, and there isn't very much difference between the tides at Brightling Sea and West Mersey. So I've put a little tide table together for, uh, for today here. Has everyone looked at tide tables in the past? Yeah. Yeah. So if you buy, if you buy um, or get little tide tables from the village shop, I don't know, can you see me? Can you see that on my screen? Um, quite often they're available free, um, you know, or 20 or 30p, but just be careful of these because often they will only show you the high watermark and they won't show you the low watermark. Um, so you might need to go onto the internet or into something called an almanac to make sure you've got the low water heights as well. So you can see today at quarter past seven, the height of tide is about just under four meters. So if you went down to Brightling Sea at quarter past seven this morning, the tide would be in. Um, and then at 20 to two this afternoon uh, at Mersey, the tide will be out, but you'll still have a meter of water uh, left in the sea, if that makes sense. Um, and then there's another high water, which is at 20 to eight this evening. So if you're planning a trip, it's quite good to kind of get a feel in your mind of when there's going to be low water and when there's going to be high water. But for today also, because it's winter time, you just need to be aware that sunset is at five to four. So whilst you've got a high water here at 20 to 8, which means you'd have lots of water and be safe to come back into Brightling Sea, you might be doing that in the dark. So just be, be aware of that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, this sure. Is, I have seen tide timetables before, because obviously you can't even go to West Mersey without checking, because <laughs> driving across can be quite dangerous otherwise. Yeah. But um, there's... What does it mean? Does it mean that it's four metres deep? And where, yeah. where is it four metres deep? Next. No. Um, it, it, um, very briefly, there's, um, there's a kind of a sense that there's always water in the sea. Yeah. Yeah. So when, even if there was no tide, there would still be water in, in the sea. Yeah. And that is called chart datum. And your tide tables show what goes in and what comes out above what's ordinarily in the sea. So it doesn't show you the total depth of water. And, and that will become more obvious as I go to, as we look at the chart. Mm -hmm. So it only shows you what comes in and what goes out on that day. It's not the total depth. That's a really good point. Um, so this is your weather forecast. We've all seen weather forecasts, but these are the weather forecasts I looked at to make sure that we'd be safe today. Um, so you can see the wind is um, south southwesterly, going southerly. It's going to be dry, but you might get gusts of 28 miles an hour. Okay, so those are the sorts of conditions that we're looking at in terms of our environment. And the next thing is the boat, making sure um, that you, if you have a choice, that you choose the right boat, or if you don't have a choice, that you use that to decide when, where to go and how to go. So I just put some pictures together here. So these are our WOW single-handers and double hander here, the laser 2000. I couldn't find a picture of Vanessa's way barge because that would be an ideal boat um, to take. Um, or something a bit bigger. These um, small keel boats on the left-hand side are called Sonatas and they're sort of 20-ish foot um, and they've got keels on the bottom. And we usually sell them with about three people in at Brightling Sea. So, Based on the conditions, look at what boat you take with you. And then the sorts of things that you're thinking about with your boat is what type of boat it is, how much the size and stability of it, what sort of sails you might take, whether it's got an engine, because that might be quite handy. Um, the equipment that you've got on board, mainly this relates to safety equipment. So making sure that you've got oars or a dinghy, a radio, um, an anchor, if you're thinking about staying the night, Maria, and um, not coming back with us for your return journey, make sure you've got an anchor. 
Um, or if you're thinking you want to tie up at the other end, make sure you've got lines so that you can tie up. And then the third aspect here is the crew. So making sure that your crew actually want to come with you. <laughs> <laughs> because if that can be quite painful if they don't want to come with you or if they're very nervous and you know so you need to make sure that it's fun for your crew um, and they've got the proper clothing on um, and they're happy to um, come along and, and do what's needed and also you've got the right number for your boat as well so if you're taking a single hand you don't want to load it up with three of you and a dog unless it's a topper of course on a very sunny day so choosing your boat and your crew is really important as well and then the third piece when I started, they said there were three things that we need to think about, the environment, the boat and the navigation. And often people get the navigation piece so that they spend a huge amount of time on the navigation and then forget to ask their crew whether they really want to come along or not. So you need to balance those three things, your consideration of the environment, the boat and the navigation. So this is the navigation. Um, and the bits and pieces that you might need to um, help you are the charts which you've got. Um, there are all sorts of other navigation aids, electronic aids, rather like you've got your sat, sat nav in a car, you can um, have a GPS for a boat. Compasses, compasses are really, um, really helpful, even if you've got, um, I, sorry, I meant to bring my hand bearing compass with me. Um, I'll show you that another time. And many of you will have compasses on your boats. Um, some way of recording where you want to be versus where you actually end up being. So um, a pencil writes really nicely on um, most a fiberglass um, and can easily be wiped off with a bit of GIF afterwards or a pen and paper if you think um, you might need that or an electronic device. Again, just to make sure that you, you don't get lost and that you, you can record that you're um, you are where you think you are. And then the things that can actually help your journey in practice are the wind direction, which way the tide's going, um, and the strength of any tide as well. So those are the sorts of things that can help you in your navigation. Is this all making sense? Yeah. So if you look at the, um, I don't know if you can see that, if you look at the chart that I sent you, which is this one, sort of the big one with the island in the middle. Has everyone got that? Mm -hmm. oh. no, that um, no, but I'll make do, I'm sure I'll figure it out. Oh, okay, okay. So um, we're going to start our journey and it's a return journey from here. Can you see my cursor, Hannah? Yeah. At Brightlingsea, which is here. And we're going to travel to West Mersey, which is here. And we're going to go this way around the island, because if you go this way, you'll see that the water sort of stops here somewhere. And then this gets very marshy. And to your point earlier, um, Maria, this bit of land actually sticks up quite high. So even when you've got a metre of tide coming in, this bit of land sticks up three, about three metres. And on your chart, you might be able to see a little number three with an underline on it. Near the, in that area. And because that number has got an underline on, on it, it means that it sticks up. So it means the land sticks up there. So at low water, which we worked out would be a metre of tide, even with a metre of tide on top of here, you're still going to have two metres sticking up. So your boat will come this way and go, flat and you have rather a long walk um, and also as Maria said there is a roadway that goes across here which does not have um, a gap underneath it so we've got to come this way so we're going to come this way and we're going to stop here at West Mersey for lunch and then we're going to make our way back again so again I've done some calculations and things in the background for you and I've scribbled on the map so you'll see there are two routes there's a red one and there's a purple one. Can you see those? So the red one is for um, people who choose a boat that is less than a meter deep. 
So um, you'll often hear people say, how much does a boat draw? And that's what they refer to as to how deep is the boat. Is the boat. So if your boat is less than a metre deep, you can do a shortcut. But if you want to take one of the bigger boats, like a Sonata, and they draw one and a half metres about, then you'll need to come the long way around because there isn't enough depth here. So if you look at this area here on your chart and those numbers in the light, the sort of darker blue, it says you'll see a zero and then a little five or a zero and a little six, you might see a one. And those numbers, they don't have lines underneath them. So they actually mean that's the depth of water when the tide has already gone out. Is this making sense, Maria, to your point about how much tide is coming in? Yeah. yeah. So, so if you were to come this way on the red line, you can see that you'd have um, where it says zero and then little eight. That means 0.8 of a metre of water is already there. Or 0.1. So you know that even at low water today, you've got a metre on top of that. So if you come this way, you should always have more than a metre underneath the bottom of your boat. And I've worked that out for you in advance. Okay. And the same if you come the other way, but if you're in a deep boat, boat that draws much more, you should still have more than a metre underneath you if you take this route here, because you're coming That's down a slight, using slightly deeper water. Does that make Question. sense? Question? Yeah. You've got slightly more than a meter underneath your boat. That's great. What about big waves? The trough in a wave? Yes. You, that's a really good point, um, Abby, particularly if you're going out in bad weather or you've got conditions where the wind is against the tide. Mm -hmm. Generally, you, I would, even in a big boat, I would allow probably between one and two metres beneath you, unless you're crossing the channel. So the fact that you've got one metre in addition underneath you, in addition yeah. to the depth of your boat, should be more than enough mm. for today's conditions. Does that Thank answer, Abby? Yeah. So I've, you'll see some scribbles um, on the boat. The red arrows here are the way the tidal mm. flow Sorry, yep. Jean, I think Julia has a question as well. Oh, Julia? Um, John, I'm a bit confused about, you said the 0.5 or the 0.6 is the tide at its lowest. I, I'm not sure I understand that in relation to when the tidal tables change. So, for example, today the lowest tide was one meter about. Yes. But we know that in a week's time, that could be zero. Sometimes it even reads negative. Does that mean that it's going to be negative less than the 0 0.5? No. So what you see on the chart, what's written on the chart is what's left. So it's almost like if you're in the bath and you take the plug out, even with the plug out of the bath, what the chart shows is the water that's left in the bath always. You, you mean at the lowest of the spring tides? Uh, yes. Yes. So it yes. cannot be lower than that. Um, it, no, the simple answer is no, it cannot be lower than that. But the real answer is it could be in certain conditions. Oh yeah, no, God. it can't. Be, <laughs> take, take, take it as it can't be lower than what's on the chart. So, so that includes when, when the lowest tide is negative, when, when you see it on the chart. Yes. yes. Good. So, so if it's positive, you add it to that minimum. Yeah. If it's negative, what do you do? You can't take it off. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I do see what you mean. Yes, I do. I do. Can, could, perhaps I could talk to you about that. OK, yes, sorry. Time because, because those those conditions actually are very, You, I, I don't know where those conditions would be on the East Coast. 
Okay, in the sorry. UK. So, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. No, but yeah, you're right. It's a it, it's a good question. Jean, um, the, the bit I liked was you said there's always water in the sea. So <laughs> irrespective of the tides, there's always water in the sea. I liked that bit. <laughs> It's comforting, yes. <laughs> yeah. Ending. Yeah. Um, yes, and so this chart here shows the blue and the white shows the water that's always left in the sea. And the green shows the mud and the brown shows the land. So today, until lunchtime, the tide is moving in the direction of these red arrows. Oh, sorry. My computer seems to have stuck. Ah, there we go. Um, and it's moving again. I've done some calculations in the background. It's moving at about a knot. So again, in the small boat, that's significant to know that on the way out, you're going to have a knot of tide helping you to get out as far as um, this point here. But then you might, if you were going up towards Mers Mersey before noon, you'll have a knot of tide against you. So it's about thinking about how the, the direction of the water flowing, the tide is going to help you. So until noon, it's going in this direction. And then afternoon, it's going in the opposite direction, the green. Uh, and then the wind direction at the bottom here is moving from south southwesterly to southerly during the day. So those are the things you can think if I want to go here, I'm going to have the tide with me before lunchtime, but I'm going to be against the wind. So I'm going to have to tack here. But actually, once I get to here, whilst I'll have the tide against me, I will hopefully have the wind on my side and I'll have a really nice sail all the way up here and then into West Mersey I'll have the wind behind me as I come in. Okay so that's the journey to West Mersey. Does that does that make sense for everybody? Yes. So if we then move so then the things that you we've hopefully thinking about whilst we see all of that is all right well what time do I actually want to leave West leave Brightling Sea? Um, how long is the journey going to take me? And also what time do I need to be heading for home? So one of the things I think we don't think about well I certainly don't think about in a dinghy other than trying to make the boat go faster so that I can beat the next person is actually how fast my boat is going. So it's quite helpful to know, or to at least have some idea of how fast your boat is going. So I've worked out that the journey will be, for those taking the shortcut, um, that will be about seven nautical miles. And for the journey, for those taking the longer route, that will be about 11 nautical miles. So if, I don't know, how fast do you think your boats go? Vanessa, if you took the way barge with you, how fast would that go? The best you'd get would be four to five knots, probably less in a way, Sarah. Obviously, that's not allowing for the effect of the tide. Yeah. But most dinghies um, top out at about five knots going upwind, faster going offwind, obviously. Yeah. So if you say four to five knots and it's going to be seven nautical miles, I'm estimating here, you know, the bulk of the journey is going to take you at least two hours. And then you need to allow a bit of extra time for faffing at either end. Um, and it will never take you as short a time as you think it's going to take you anyway. So you probably... We did Brightling Sea to Bradwell and back and Wayfarers. And that took all day. Yeah. Yeah. So you so again back to Maria's point, you might look at the map and think, oh, it'd be really easy to get to West, West Mersey and back again in a day. But that's probably totally unrealistic by the time you've got everybody there. 
Um, and also you want to have some time for lunch and cake. You don't want to be rushing that, do you? So I would say for this trip, actually, you might want to do as Maria had originally suggested <laughs> um, and stay overnight and come back the following day. So that's just summarising, reminding us what we're looking at, which is the environment, what boat we're choosing and how we're going to navigate. So let's actually look at some of the detailed um, navigating. So if, we, if I wanted to show you this, um, there are some things that we can look for along the way. Um, and these pictures here show boys. I don't know if are any of you, I think you will have spotted these. So this one here is, is called a lateral mark and it's green and it's a cone shape. And that means that that's a starboard mark. And then this one here, can you see the shape has changed slightly? It's much more flat at the top. It's a can mark. Um, it's red and it's a can shape. And this is a port lateral mark. And these boys mark the channels. So they're either side of the channels and they are laid in the UK anyway. Um, so as you're coming into port, this mark will be on your right hand side, the starboard mark will be on your right hand side and the port mark will be on the left hand side. Okay, so you're looking for red and green marks to make sure that you're on the right road um, and you're on the right side of the road. I have put a YouTube link in there for anyone who wants to watch it afterwards, but I'm afraid I couldn't get that to actually work whilst I was sharing the screen. So that's for you to look at afterwards if you want to. Um, and then the other mark that um, marks that you might see along the way are called cardinal marks. So that's this one here. This is a south cardinal mark. And cardinal marks mark the four points of the compass. So there's a north cardinal mark, uh, east, south, and a west cardinal mark. And they all have slightly different shapes. Can you see at the top of this cardinal mark, there are like two arrowheads pointing downwards. And that is a south cardinal mark. The north cardinal mark has two arrows pointing upwards, pointing north. Uh, the east cardinal mark has the two cardinal marks, so it looks like an Easter egg. So you have one pointing up and one pointing down for east. And then for the west cardinal mark, the cardinal, the, the black triangles almost give a W. So the points are pointing in towards. Um, but anyway, that's just so that you know that there are four different types and that's some of what they look like. So if we, there are all sorts of different bits of information that are available for looking at where you're going to. So I have sent you the proper chart, which is an extract there. Can you see I'm showing that? A bit around it so I can see. So if you look at that one, but you can also get, again, from probably from the Chandleries um, or from the Harbour Master, you can also get other information, which is what I'm showing you here. Um, and I also wanted to show you that you can get pictures of what a port that you're leaving from looks like from, um, from above as well. So this is Brightlingsea. This is the river. This goes up to um, uh, a really nice pub and sort of sheltered area. So that's where you'd go if you needed a plan B. And this uh, um, turning left takes you out to sea. And you can see all the boats along here. Um, and you can see the sort of beach and the hard bits here. It's quite useful to look at if you're going somewhere where you don't know. So you can, when you get there, you can think, oh yeah, okay, I recognize this. So if we look at the chart that you've got here in front of you, you'll see, can you all see your little um, charts? You'll see this area here is actually Brightling Sea itself. Um, so we've got the blue and the white of the water, 
the green of the mud and the brown of the land. Um, and any of you who've used the Lido in Brightling Sea, that is marked on too. Lovely Lido. But sadly closed in COVID. Um, the Yacht Club in Brightling Sea, for those of you who've been to the Yacht Club, is just here. Um, and there is also um, a town slipway, which is just this side as well. So again, if you're thinking about launching a dinghy, you'll see that you need to make sure that the green bit, which is shown as mud, is covered up by tide. Okay. So assuming we're in the water and we're ready to go, what sort of things do we need to look at? So you'll see this mark here is um, a cardinal mark. Jean, we've just got a question from Pippa. Um, in a dinghy, do you need to think about mooring? Availability. When you're, well, probably when you get to West Mersey. Yes. Well, there are several options when you get to West Mersey, and again, you you would need to have looked at West Mersey in the same way that I'm looking at Brightening Sea um, here. And now I've sent you a little chart of West Mersey as well, hopefully. Um, and you'll see that there's a yacht club marked there. So yes, absolutely. So you, and that's why I said you need to think about: Do you want to anchor when you get there? Will you pick, be picking up a mooring buoy um, and tying yourself to that and leaving the dinghy there? Um, there is a little taxi that operates at West Mersey, so you can radio and somebody will come and fetch you from mooring or from an anchorage. Or you could, uh, if you had a dinghy, you could um, stay at the yacht club, and I think there's a slip that you can get right up to you might need to bring the Yacht Club in advance, just to check. Does that answer, Pippa? Yeah. One of the things about presenting is I can't see other people. I can see Gemma, I don't see. So as we're coming out of Brightling Sea, we're going to go north of this cardinal mark and we're gonna head down the channel here Remember we talked about lateral marks, the red and the green boys. And because you're coming out of the channel here, the red will be on your right hand side and the green will be on your left. So it's the opposite way around. And then Brightling Sea actually has a lovely transit. You'll he hear people talk about transits, which is where you line two things up that are on the shore um, and you keep them lined up and you sail or you you move along that line. And can you see by the edge of the boating lake, there are a couple of marks that have got RW beside them. And that means that they're red and white and they show a red and white light at night time. And they're like huge boards, which have got white and red painted on them. And if you line them up, you can sail out of Brightling Sea along this dotted line here. And you'll be sailing along at 0, 041 degrees. But that means that once you're through these lateral marks, if, for example, you're it's at low water, so you know today you've only got a maximum of a meter underneath you, you don't want to hit this muddy piece here. If you follow that transit, so if you look behind you and make sure those two boards are lined up, you will miss the mud and come straight out here to this other cardinal mark, which is a south cardinal mark. Can you see the two arrows actually pointing down? So you're now navigated, you're safely out past the um, south cardinal mark, and you're then going to turn um, left and head for some more lateral marks. Can you see this here is, um, it's shown as a cone. So it looks like a black triangle. So that means that that's the green boy. So you would come between the green boy and you know that you're then safely into the, into the river. Can you see the red boy is opposite here? Sorry. My work is invading me. Um, so you'll come down here with pointing going south um, with the green boy on your 
uh, left hand side and the red boy on your right hand side. Okay. So those is a lot to look to um, look at. You can see why this takes quite a bit of time. So you might look and think, oh, the journey will only take two hours. But actually, in that time, you've got to get your boat into the water. You've got to make sure that you know what all these marks are and which way you're going um, and find a Sorry. Find your way out into the river. Is everyone OK with that? Makes sense. So then we're into the middle bit. So you have to say, OK, which way did I decide to go? Did I did you choose the shortcut way with the way barge or did you go on a sonata um, and take the longer way? And what are the boys that you're looking at along the way? So this is back to where we were before. So we're now here somewhere. We've come out of Brightling Sea and we're down here. And we're thinking about, ooh, it looks very big. The sea is out there. Because suddenly from, it will feel quite different. Suddenly from being quite sheltered here, you're into open water. And as Abby said, the sea state will change, you'll get waves um, and the wind will feel much stronger, um, much stronger as well. But you'll be able to see, again, all sorts of things. So you'll be able to see more boys ahead of you. Um, and you'll also be able to see the island of West Mersey on your right hand side. And if you look across the river, you will be able to see this massive power station, which um, is Bradwell, where Vanessa said they went in the way barge and it took them all day to get there. That makes sense. So you're now in the middle bit. And then I wanted to, if you look at your bigger chart, which would be this one, you should now be able to see some other thing, some other boys that you're looking for. So if you're going the short way, you should be able to see an East Cardinal mark here. Can you see that? So at the top of that boy, which will be black and yellow, because it's a cardinal mark, like the one photograph I showed you, you'll see that there'll be two cones and the flat sides of the cones will be together. So it looks a bit like an Easter egg. And that's an East cardinal mark. And to stay safe, you need to stay east of it. So this chart, the lines go north south. So this is your East Cardinal mark. If you're going the short way around, you need to stay this side of that East Cardinal mark to make sure that you're safe. And then that means that you're not going into the green and the mud. Okay. If you're taking the longer route, which is coming down here, you'll see you'll be following more lateral marks. So about here somewhere, you should see a number eight, which is a can shape, and that's a red boy, and the number nine, which is a green boy. So those are here somewhere. And you follow the channel down, you'll see some of the um, lateral marks have got numbers and some have got names. And about here somewhere, you'll see that there are three boys. So there's a green lateral, lateral mark, which is called Colm Point, and number one. Um, and the names are actually painted onto the boys. The boys are huge. Um, so whilst you're sailing along, either with a pair of binoculars or hopefully today by eye, um, you'll be able to see the number and you'll be able to see the name on the boy. Um, and then one of the things that I quite often um, do if I'm in an unfamiliar place is I will have written the boys onto the fiberglass of the boat in pencil and then I'll literally tick them off as we go past so that then you know and you can write the time as well so that then you'll know at, you know 20 past 11 you went past Colm Point and then if there's a problem and you need to tell anyone where you are, you can say, I don't know where I am, but at 20 past 11, I went past Colm Point. And they will then have an idea of where to look for you. And it's also quite fun as well, particularly if you've got um, children or inexperienced people on the boat, um, you know, to give them something to do, something to think about. Um, 
because one of the other things that you need to think about with these this sort of trip is whether people are going to get seasick or whether they're going to get nervous um, because it's quite a different view here from here so if you keep people occupied plenty to do they generally are still smiling by the end of the trip and lots of biscuits as well that always takes you. so when we get to these three boys here we actually in the deeper boat we we will move away from the channel so we know we've got enough water underneath us and we'll leave these two lateral marks to our left hand side and we'll go round this one which on the chart you'll see it looks slightly different it's a slightly different shape it's more of a kind of bulb shape um, and it's yellow not green and we will turn west at this point here and head down across here by that time sorry Maria yep yeah? you're on mute sorry I was on mute um I just wanted to ask why is it yellow is that because it's a, a longitudinal mark or rather than that? no it's because it's a special mark oh. <clears throat> um, special marks are are yellow and they're often seasonal um but in fact that one is always there oh. but yeah thank you so this, again, for navigation, this is reasonably easy. And I'm in, I haven't gone to um, using a plotter or these for you, because basically you're going south um, until you get to this point, which would be 180. And then you're going west, which will be to 270. So then we're going to we're going to turn west. So if you're in a bigger boat, you turn west here. And if you're in a smaller boat, you're starting to make your way west here. And then if you look at this area here, which is the entrance to West Mersey, you'll see that there's a channel. Um, there's a channel marked and you start to get more lateral marks. You'll see there's a group of four red. Uh, sorry, four green. Um, lateral marks here, the, the um, triangles on the right hand side and the red boys are on the left hand side. So port to left and starboard to right as you're going up river into port. And now it's really important here, even if you're in a little boat, that you know where this channel is and you, and you stick to this, this channel. Because if you tried, sometimes when there's some a lot of water at Mersey, this looks like a channel. But actually today, because we know lunchtime, we're only going to have a meter of water, which is when we're sort of thinking of arriving, you can only get so far up this channel and then you'll be in mud, even in the little boat. So you need to come this way looking at these, looking for these uh, lateral marks. So you'll see, can everyone see that? Going back to the main, the big chart, isn't you? So you look at this, that one there, should be right up. And you'll see that there, you, the first green one that you get to is called number one. And the first red one you get to is called number two. Generally, green boys are labelled odd numbers and red boys are labelled even numbers. So um, sometimes that's, that's quite useful because they're not always in pairs on a channel. And you'll see that this channel, we need to follow the green boys right round to the right to get into West Mersey. You'll see that the red boys split and go down to the left. So we want to go in up here and the green boys follow that line, but you'll see that the red boys actually come down this way. So again, you need to make sure that you're looking to make sure that you're following the green boys as you, as you go into West Mersey. And then it will all get quite sheltered again when you're here, um, but just think about the wind direction. So the wind is going to start moving behind you here. 
So as you go up here, you're going to have the wind behind you. Again, just thinking about, um, you know, where you want people to sit and how you're going to control your speed and, and where you're going to go here. Does that all make sense? So yes, you made it to West Mersey through the channel. You're in the channel. And this is what West Mersey looks like from the air. Again, you can see that this is the channel that we need to come up here. And these are the sort of the bumps of islands that you could see. So potentially in a small boat, you could think you could come through there or come through here. But actually today you can't because there's only a meter of water. That also means, Jean, that you're going to be tacking out of there on falling water. So how narrow does it get? Sorry, you'll be... When you come out again, yeah. you'll have to tack out of the river. And you'll yeah. be on a falling tide? Uh, well, I, you hopefully, because high water is at... Uh, sorry, low water is at um, 20 to 2, hopefully yeah. you'll actually be on a rising... As on a rising tide. So, tide you, so you will have wind and tide against I, you. You're right. Which is we're going to have a nice, yeah. We're going to have a nice long lunch first, though, Abby. I think I'll yeah. and wait for the tide to. Oh, I think turn. we've decided we're staying overnight, haven't we? Oh, we're overnight. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go get my trolley. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. So this, if you move to the smaller chart which I sent you, this is um on these big charts you'll see that there are little, I don't know if you can see that, but you'll see there are sort of little purple boxes that go around a particular point, And they then show you that you need to go to another chart, a smaller chart, which is what I've given you here. So you will come we, from where we were, we we're coming up here and you will see my cursor and you'll see um, Pippa, I think you were asking about mooring at West Mersey. Uh, you'll see here there's marked small craft moorings and there are lots of particularly in the summertime there are lots of boys all along here and some of them will be marked as visitor boys so if you wanted to lasso a boy and pick up a boy you could do that and stay um, attached to that and phone the ferry to come and fetch you if you wanted to go um, to the yacht club you'll see you'll have to come up here through here and along here to get to the yacht club here and with a meter of tide assuming we're there just before low water you'd have a bit of a walk but not much so you could leave your boat um, there or if you wanted to anchor um, you can there's a little place a bit further up where you can come in and drop your anchor and that's marked on the chart as well. And then again, you can phone the ferry man to, or the ferry boat to come and fetch you. So there you go. You have got to West Mersey. Lunch. Yay. How am I doing for time, Gemma? Sorry. 11 o'clock. Is well, it's up to everyone else if we, if we want to carry on, or how's everyone fixed for time? I think Vanessa has a quiz for us, unless you want to. I would carry on if I were you. Okay, so there you go, you can have your lunch. You can either go to the yacht club, they do a very nice lunch, or you can have your lunch on a boy yourself if you've bought a nice picnic. Um, but I would be heading to the shed. <laughs> so some options for lunch. Then having had a nice lunch and made sure that everyone's really kind of relaxed and happy, um, you could head for home. <clears throat> so the return journey, <clears throat> again, thinking about the same sorts of things, but in reverse. So which way are you gonna go? Uh, and what are you going to look for along the way? And as Abby said, um, thinking about, are you going to be tacking out uh, of the river and will the tide be with you? Um, and what are you going to look for? So same again. So afternoon uh, or after midday, the tide has changed. So the tide is now in this direction. 
assuming we're heading at about, I don't know, should we say three o'clock we're heading for home? So you're coming out along this way here, heading back to the channel. And now the boys will be on the opposite side for you because you're going in the other direction. So the green boys will now be on your left hand side and the red boys will be on your right hand side. And then once you've gone past four green boys on your right hand side and you've um, got to the one that's marked number one, for those which will be about here somewhere, for those taking the shorter route, you're heading for this East Cardinal mark here. Um, and again, that should be quite a nice sail because the wind should have gone to southerly by now. So you'll have the wind on your side, nice beam reach. And for those taking the longer um, route, um, there's a mark here if you want to be really safe and make sure you've got lots of water. And that, um, those are, those, there are two marks here that are lateral marks. So they're green lateral marks. One is called bench head and one is called colm bar. So once you've got to these points, you can go, you can head for this one. As the tide is coming in, going home, you might decide that you're gonna cut this corner off if you're in the deeper boat. So you might go back to bench head, but you just need to make sure that you've got enough water to cross this piece here. So back to the yellow boy that we saw on the way going out. And the other thing to, to remember is when you're looking at charts and things, you, you might think, oh, it's just the other way around. But I don't know if any of you have done a bike ride one way, a route on a bike one way, one week, or even a walk, and then done it the other way the next week. And they can look quite different. So it can be quite, it still can be quite disorientating. Um, so just to bear that in mind and make sure that you feel comfortable that you know what you're looking for. Um, and you can use bearings to help you. So on the way back, you're going about 90 degrees, that's east, and then you're going to head north, which is zero, zero, zero. So once you've got to these marks here, your east cardinal mark and your yellow mark, you're heading north back up the channel, past the lateral marks. And again, remember the boys are going to be laid the other way now because you're going in the opposite direction. So you will have the green boys on your right hand side and the red boys on your left hand side. And you'll make your way up here. You'll have the tide underneath you and you'll have the wind behind you as you turn and come back up the river. And that could, if it's about three o'clock, it could possibly be in fading light. So you'll start, this would be, if that would be a really nice trip because the wind will be behind you, the tide will be behind you, so the water will be really flat, um, and you'll start to see the twinkling lights of all the boys. So the red boys will show red flashing lights, and the green boys will show green flashing lights, and the cardinal marks show white flashing lights. So as you're coming up into Brighton Sea, do you remember? Here we go. We've, by, these are the boys I've marked for you. So as you come, as we're coming up into Brightling Sea here, there'll be a cluster of boys that you're looking for. One of which is that cardinal mark. Can anyone tell me what the cardinal mark is on the outside, or just on the outskirts of Brightling Sea that you're looking for? It's the one at the entrance to Brightling Sea. Can anyone see it? Is it bright? It says bright. Is it Brightling Sea Spit? Or is that just a landmark nearby? Yes, that's it. Yep, it's Brightling Sea Spit. And do you know what sort of a cardinal mark that is? It's a southerly one. Yeah. So again, if it's in fading light, the cardinal marks have the light characteristics on the cardinal mark are the same as a clock. So your south cardinal mark, you will see six flashing white lights. So in the fading light, you'll be looking for six flashing white lights. 
as well as that, you should probably be able to see the cardinal mark as well. And then once you've got to the cardinal mark, which is here, can everyone see that? You will, you'll be on the edge of this transit. And remember, as I said, as you come out of Brightling Sea, there's these really nice red and white boards that you can line up. Again, in fading light, um, you can, they will be flashing red. So you can line those two up and aim for those. So you'll go in and you can also use a compass. So if you head on a bearing of 041 on your compass along this line here, that will take you to these lateral marks, the red on the left hand side and the green on the right hand side, so that you know that you're safely into Brightling Sea. So for me, passage planning is all about making sure that everyone has a really nice time and I'm really comfortable about what I'm looking for on the way out, what to kind of expect in the middle bit, and then how I'm going to um, end up where I need to end up. So hopefully this experience for you, I always try to make coming home really nice as well. So hopefully this experience for you has been really lovely. It's fading light, it's flat sea, you've had the wind behind you and the tide with you. You've been able to see the twinkling lights of Brightling Sea, pick up this six flashing white lights and then get onto this transit with the red lights lined up behind you. And then as you come round this corner here, you'll see the green flashing light of the lateral mark and Brightling Sea and you'll know that you're safely home. And then you'll just be able to turn left in your dinghy to the yacht club and your trailer will be waiting for you there. And if you're in one of the sonatas, you'll come a bit further round and put the sonata against a pier here somewhere. Tie it up nicely and you're home. Jean, can I ask a question? If it's sure. um, a, a cardinal with an easterly mark, does that mean it has three flashing lights? Yes. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and the westerly has nine. Um, it's a slight variation. I'm simply, yeah, slight variation, but yeah, that's the general gist. So this is back to the the um, drawing that I got from the harbour master of Brightling Sea. Again, just showing you where you need to be. So this is the yacht club here, and then this is would be the um, the pontoon where you'd leave a, a sonata. All your radio channels are on here, so if you need to get the harbour master to help you to do anything, just call them on channel 68, they're really helpful. Uh, and you know you can pick up a taxi from here. So you're safely home in Brightling Sea. <laughs> That's it, passage planning lesson over. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, thank you. Absolutely thank you. fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, there's a there's a lot of information in there, so hopefully you had fun. I feel like I've been on a day out now. Yeah, good. <laughs> Can almost Excellent. smell that sea air. Yes. Dix <laughs> let me his boat, but only virtually. He said, "I can't use it in real life, but I can pretend to be sailing it today." <laughs> <laughs> so you should have sat on it with a laptop. <laughs> I think Maria, that we should go out in your 2001 wow session not tell him just take your boat out so you can sail it without him breathing down your neck Abby if you were out in there he'd be fine he's sure he trusts you it's me he doesn't trust <laughs> yeah, so that's what I mean one of us should go out with you with you only your boat and then we can post videos of you going <laughs> <laughs> they'll be divorced <laughs> If anyone's anyway. got any questions, happy to take them or email them afterwards if you think of them or have you? Um, yes, I just thought of one. Um, looking at the pictures of both Brightling Sea and West Mercy, the harbours, there's lots and lots of boats already moored up. Is it really difficult to, you know, keep clear of everybody and, and how how taut are the boys that they're attached to? I mean, can you get caught on ropes? Is it really quite tricky getting in and out? If it, 
it is, and I mean, I would say just avoid them, really. If if um, boats are moored up um, and tied to moorings, they will swing a little bit, but mostly where you see them tied in the channels, they're actually on moorings where they're tied both fore and aft, so they're oh. not on swinging moorings. Okay. Um, so they don't move as much as you might, you know, as you might move if you were on an an anchor. Yeah. Everyone's really friendly and um and helpful and i think once you're on the water as well you do get a sense of it's kind of like being on a footpath or being on the road you mm. can see which ways people are going um and people will avoid i mean particularly at brightening sea and west mersey too i guess people know that there are such a lot of children using all kinds of craft and enjoying them people are generally very good about keeping out of the way and if it's a bigger boat, well, I mean, obviously you get one or two that are not that helpful, but mostly people are really friendly. I'm just a bit concerned with um, the fact that you've got the tide with you and you've got the wind behind you and you're coming into port and there are all those boats. I'm thinking, yeah. oh, I'm going to be going too fast. I'm going to slow down and uh, oh, I'm going to miss all these craft in the way. Well, would it be an option, Jean, just to put your engine on for that bit, to st like furl your sails and then just potter in, and then you you know you're going to be under control, don't you? Well, sometimes actually, Gemma, it's easier to be under sail. Mm. Um, but you're right, an engine um, a, an engine's um, an option, and certainly for sailors like yourselves, you know, who are really used to smaller boats and. Um, you know, putting them where you want them to go. You could, for example, just take your mainsail down if you were in a double hander in the way barge, for example, you just take the mainsail down and go in under the jib. Um, and the other thing to remember is you can use the tide to help you. So the tide is a great break. So if you point into the tide with your boat, um, you, you can get some really good control. So if you're under engine, for example, yeah, make sure that you're doing your manoeuvres into the tide. Yeah, but it can be. That's half the excitement, Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'll have been I'll be exhausted by the time I'm heading back, trying to navigate my way back home. Ding, I take it it's illegal to sort of pull yourself up on a beach instead, is it? No. Oh, it gives lots of beaches around there. Could you just sort of sail to the yeah. beach? Yourself yeah, up. We, used to, yeah. we used to do that. There were seven of us that used to take lasers and picos from Seska and go down in January, I might add, for Ed Deacon's 40th birthday, maybe. I've never been so cold on a boat in my life. <laughs> but we launched, we left the dinghies on the hard and launched off the beach and sailed around, had lunch on a spit somewhere. And I, I will add to that, that they all went out into the main channel and I took one look at it and thought I'd sail up the river. Thank you very much. <laughs> but yeah, we used to do that. I was just thinking that might be an alternative that might be actually easier when you're in a dinghy than trying to get in out of the harbor because I share Veronica's fears. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing is to go in a group to go as, as a group and, and um, somebody to act as the lead. Would you say Brightling Sea to West Mercy is one of the sort of um, better sort of routes for uh, beginners heading out? I mean, not beginners as in complete beginners say, but people who are heading onto open waters for the first time. Everything's gone. Jean, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. It is quite, I would say it's quite challenging actually. And there are easier places. Vanessa, do you have some suggestions? For... I wouldn't do Brightling Sea to West Mersey by myself. If I was, well, I don't think I'd go anywhere to see on my own. <laughs> I'm not planning the Vendée Globe just yet. <laughs> I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't do it as a first time trip. I would definitely do it in company. Do we, do we want do we want to do the quiz? Yeah, okay. Yes. Do you have to log in to do the quiz? Or... Have you got Kahoot on your phone, Veronica? Oh, oh, I can't. I don't know where my phone is. I've lost it. <laughs> can't I just do it on the laptop screen? <laughs> I've got both um, the web internet and the Zoom on the, on the same screen and just got them sort of sharing half a screen each. Oh dear. I think that's a bit beyond my capability. Sounds a bit cool. As in like, it's not on full screen, it's just a smaller little box. Smaller smaller window. I'm going on a 50% screen. I know that just, I've just got black all over my screen in a tiny... <laughs> Can you open like another tab and then separate them out? Um... Uh, I'm going to open another tab. Share screen. Hang on. Oh. Uh, oh, I think I might just have to listen to the questions and write them down. <laughs> Are we ready? Yep. coming in no i'm just watching <laughs> got six people is that right oh no i've got pen and paper ready <laughs> okay. jean can you hear me only just so jean's question so i'm hoping if she can hear me she can talk through them Yes, I can hear you. Okay, any more? Oh. No, I've just... Oh, for goodness sake. Okay. Let's go. So, the first question is... A multi-select... What resources can you use for passage planning? So what resources can you use for passage planning? Charts, tide tables, an almanac, or a cake recipe? So we can have multiple. Yep, multiple answers. Yeah. <laughs> I've got the hang of this system now. I know what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. Last week, I think I got a bit muddled as to what we were actually meant to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That looks like Lancaster. Yay! Everything but cake recipe. Oh, why uh, did I got that right? <laughs> oh, apparently, but I pressed, must have pressed the wrong button. <laughs> it's a submit oh, yeah. thing, isn't it? <coughs> oh, yeah, I forgot to do that. So, all those, you're right, yes, everything except for, for a cake recipe. Although, cake recipe is important, but you'd want the cake already made rather than the recipe. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Making that on a wayfarer, sort of sitting there driving the cake at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, Maria, well done. <laughs> Second question, so this is a true or false. Um, and the question is, a passage plan can take whatever form you like, picture, text, paper, electronic. Is that true or false? One second left. True. Yeah, that's right. To be compliant with Solas 5, it can take whatever form you like. You must just have one. Oh, Catherine's taking the leaderboard. Drum roll. Question three. So again, this is yeah. what? Oh, what? <laughs> what? Is it wrong with that I one? Know what happened there? Something. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to answer. No, so really? time's up. Okay, but the answer is it's <laughs> false. Yeah. So Solus Five applies to pleasure craft as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are we all getting a point for that then? Yeah. That's right. Right, it's a good job. Pencil and paper still work. <laughs> <laughs> No change there. All the same place. You have to be able to read really fast. Can you manage to put a chair without standing my way? Question four. No. So what are the three main elements of a passage plan? Ten seconds. Yeah, there's a bit of a clue there, isn't there? There's a multi answer, but it's only three of them. <laughs> Navigation and closing. No. Yeah. Was a crew was a crew one of them? Was crew part of the bait? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking crew and I just couldn't see it listed. And I was thinking, I'm sure a crew and being happy and not yeah. forcing people to come out with you was one of the things. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I was just thinking of my friend, my son Toby, <laughs> being forced to come out and complain the whole time. Oh, the leaderboard's changing. <laughs> Question five. And this is a true or false. The inshore forecast may differ from the offshore forecast on a given day. Is that true or false? <laughs> true, yes, absolutely. So you might be sitting on the beach thinking, oh, this will be a lovely day, and then look out around the corner and it's foul. Or the other way around. Oh, Catherine's getting those points. Pippa joining. <laughs> Question six. How can tidal flow be used to influence boat speed? This multi-question. Yeah. What, one answer. Is it one answer? Oh. Oh. Yeah, one answer. Can push you aside. That's a nice looking boat. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer I was looking for there is that it will slow you down if you point into it. Um, yeah, well done, everyone. Could you not get swept out to sea as well if it went wrong? I mean, I, I actually got the right answer, but I was kind of thinking 
it was multi and so because the greed might be right too yeah and in fact it will push you sideways too but the answer that I was looking for was it will slow you down if you point into it because particularly when you're leaving or arriving actually knowing how you can slow yourself down quickly um and people will often go for the engine or think about the sails and they forget to think about just point into the tide and you'll slow down quite dramatically you know if you just do a 360 on the spot or 180 on the spot oh Catherine Catherine's on fire Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> question seven. Oh yeah what special status does Brightling Sea have does anyone know their history? That's just one answer. Oh, no. <laughs> That's what it is. Eight seconds. Seems to have a lot more time on this one. Some of Nikki's quizzes, I feel like you think <laughs> rushing to answer. Yeah, it's a thank port. Well done. They have all sorts of lovely um, festivals and things that go on in the port and certain legal status too. Three Jean. prayers hits an answer street. Da -da -da. Jean, what is a sank port though? Just out of interest. Uh, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's um, a league gives the port certain legal status, which helped it in terms of in, in times of trade. It was a big trading port at one point. So something that was given by Henry VIII. It just means they have, they have nice parties. Oh, hear me. Oh. Yep, West Mercy oysters. You pay a fortune for them at the oyster bars in London and elsewhere. And they are very tasty. Oh, oh Maria is I have, been, I have been to the oyster bar a number of times. That might be one. <laughs> I don't actually like oysters, but I still hang around there. So. <laughs> Question nine. Which of these can influence sea state? Wind with tide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multi answer. So, wind with tide, if the wind's against the tide, different seabed contours, or boat length. Eight seven six five four. Three. Excellent. Did, oh, Catherine's taking over again. <laughs> Hannah, highest answer streak of six. Wow. Oh, that's new. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm not doing this as smoothly as you do it. I'm really stressed. And last question. What information will you find in a tide table? Oh, great photograph. Vanessa chose the photograph. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So what information will you find in a tide table? Yeah. Used. Three, two, oh, one. Hit no. submit. Well done. Oh no. Excellent. So all of them except for total water depth, because your total water depth would include the water that's already in the sea, which is not included in the tide table. Does that make sense? Brilliant. Well done, everyone. Do, do, do. Podium time. Oh, oh. third. Woo <laughs> Maria, second. And the champion today is 
Catherine. Woo. Ah, that's good. Well done, everyone. I think I got the hang of how to get onto Kahoot for next time. <laughs> oh, excellent. Did it make sense, Veronica? Yes, yes, yes. That was great. Are you there, Vanessa? I am, but I don't think you can hear me. Can kind of hear oh. you. Oh. you. You just sound like you're at sea. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's a oh, compass. Nice compass. <laughs> it wobbles rather a lot. <laughs> Oh, hand bearing compass. Yes, I really like those. You look through them. Oh. Has everyone used one of those before? No. Oh, there you go. Vanessa was demonstrating. You look through and you line up and what you'll be able to see is a compass scale moving from right to left with a line in the middle and you line up your line in the middle with the scale that you see moving right to left. That looks really awesome. good. Ooh. Vanessa brought it with her. I think when we were, did the. Can you remember when we did the Solent and we went pretend sailing around the Solent? <laughs> we all used it then, didn't we, Vanessa? Uh, that looks really good. Where did you get that from? eBay. Oh. <laughs> it's worth looking on eBay or Dingy Bits or Yossy Bits. Well, I thought they were expensive, Jean. I don't know what you. Mm. They are expensive. Does it have a special name? It's called a hand bearing compass. Just, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's all I. Yeah. Oh. There you go. Classimo. Iris fifty. That was brilliant. Thank you, Jean, so much for that. It was really enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's it very, very fantastic. Good. Fantastic. Uh, so Will we will we get um, on to a, a, a plan for Brightling Sea then this 2021 if we can? Definitely, definitely. Um, even if it's just that we take, because Nikki and I have finally managed to make our power boat work. Um, so it might be that we could just take some of our own dinghies and do something. And then we've got an escort boat as well, which I wouldn't want to do it without. So maybe even if it's just we take some dinghies and um, just do a day trip or what, a weekend trip or an overnight trip, something would be really good. So, yeah. And actually, Jean, you see up taking your boat. Sorry? Is that me? Would you be able to take your boat? Probably, I guess. <laughs> Someone else was able to help me. Yeah, we've got tow, but we can tow it fine. We just don't tow it very often. I was also, I was also wondering, Vanessa, whether the group would like to to reach out to the ladies who launch group that runs out of the Coal Yacht Club and perhaps do something combined. I could, I'll speak speak to Jane and and. Um, do an email chain perhaps with just you, me and Jane and see whether that would be possible. Include Gemma because she's much more efficient than I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be fun. And I know the group would like to meet all of you as well. Yeah, that do they be... do they meet weekday or weekends normally? They usually meet fortnightly on a Thursday. Um, so it's during the day. So it's a similar group, a similar sort of ethos. The idea is that you know children's are children are at school or jobs don't need to be done on a Thursday and the river's relatively quiet and the boats are freely available. So. Sounds heavenly. Mm. Um, oh, I'm I'm hoping that um, in two weeks' time we'll be able to go sailing again. Yay! <laughs> You know, let's fingers crossed. So, um, we need one more topic for next week. Anyone? Any requests? 
Have to think about it. Not coming to dinner. Have a think about it and let me know. Otherwise, um, I will try and think of something myself. Or we can just do a, a general roundup and chat and then go on the water, hopefully, in two weeks' time. Vanessa, Vanessa um, we, we most a lot of us have PB2, uh, but we don't have, if you like, a single manned rescue boat. Is it, is it worthwhile going through uh, what a, a small number of people have been doing? Rescue boat facilities with just one person in the boat? Uh, uh, academically for next Tuesday. Okay. I, I found there was a video, I think, was it on the the instructors Facebook group or something that I found really helpful. So that might be worth mm. sharing. Yeah, we would send it so we could do safety boat duty, mm. the COVID version of the safety boat course, uh, safety boat. That would be great to share. Even that. if you're not a powerboat driver, actually just like when you're in your boat, it's kind of good to know what the power boat is attempting to do to help you. Like, mm. so, yeah. Is there a link that we could have that rather than... Yeah, I, it might be something just additional. <laughs> I can try and do something with some RYA video um, clips and the one that you, Hannah, was the one you saw um, an RYA one or the Tom Fletcher one? I think it was an RYA one. I thought it was very good, whatever it was. Okay. <laughs> so good that I can't remember, <laughs> clearly. Roger, we were on the course on Saturday because Roger yep. and I are doing lots of courses, I'm saying. Yep. Yep. Um, they, um, didn't you ask some questions about point of sale, if I remember rightly? Is that something you'd want to pick up when we're on the water as well? So take me through that again. <laughs> was well, this one of Ed's? Yeah, well, we did Ed's, and then afterwards you yeah. said it'd be really helpful to understand what, like, close haul and that, and oh, I right. kind of yeah, understood it is. I could have understood it is the points of sale, but I might have misunderstood it. But. No, it's 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 the jargon that throws me: uh, broad reach, close reach, uh, um, uh, and sometimes I just get totally and utterly lost on what are you trying to say? Oh, you want me to do X, Y, Z? It was the jargon that threw me. Um, That's why I brought it up. I thought that yeah, might be something we might want to pick yeah, up that, next week when we're doing stuff. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think you weren't the only one because I think Veronica, didn't you get? Was it you that was confused about? Um, oh, vans in well, stickers and that? yes, I could do with having a whole list of vocabulary, sort of do a glossary. So I, then I could keep going back and referring to it because it's like Lee Wood, Winwood, Win. Oh, I find that hard. Lee. <laughs> um, yes, broad reach, close. I know what close haul is. I've always got yeah, uh, quite good at close haul, but. Um, yeah, something, if there was a good list that you could just keep referring to, with pictures, preferably. <laughs> do you want to do that? Any of you instructors out there? Does anybody want to run that? I could probably put together a list. <laughs> Maybe. Let me have a go at doing that. <laughs> when do I need to do it by? Tuesday. By Tuesday, okay. I'll try and get it to you before Tuesday so you can fill the gaps of what I've missed out. Perfect. So a list of terms. Because like with leeward and windward, I got mixed up what it meant was, is it the side the sail is on or is it the side your bottom's on? Yeah, it's where the wind's coming <laughs> from or where the wind's, wind's going to. It's like, you know, a southerly wind, is that coming from the south or to the south or, you know? <laughs> To stop and think, you know, because it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't sink in. I have to keep, yeah. Okay, so there's leeward and windward. There's points of sail. 
Has anyone got anything else that they've heard that they're not quite sure of? Uh, could, could we do a refresher on over over overlapping at uh, the mark? So rules. Uh, oh, I can't do rules. <laughs> <laughs> You should have come to the Saturday session. He did. Vanessa, he was there. <laughs> Don't worry about my mice. You were there, weren't you, Roger? Yeah, I was. He was. We did Tom's weather and we did yeah, Ed's, so. great, um, Ed's downwind sailing. Yeah. And Roger was definitely there. Oh, definitely there, yeah. I'll include overlapping in my list of terms and see if I can find a definition. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, yeah. that's marvelous. I've just suddenly thought of something that I wanted to ask earlier on because it was about speed. Jean was talking about the speed on the water and you were talking about knots and then nautical miles. So I didn't know how how many knots will get you so many nautical miles. I, 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 that, that was whirring in my head. 1.0158. But what does that mean? <laughs> I think that's a nautical mile. So how will I know how about how many I don't know. And how long it'll take me to do a nautical mile? Uh, it depends how many knots you're doing. But I don't know. How will I know how many knots I'm doing? <laughs> You put a piece of rope with knots out of the bucket. Find out. I'll add that to my list of things to find out. Ah, right. I don't know the answer, but I'll look it up. <laughs> Dirk has some um, kind of speedometer. Yeah. I guess he's, he's still he going has, on about it. On, on the Sonatas, the for example, on the Sonatas, for example, in the bottom of the hull, uh, there's like a little paddle. Oh. And the paddle moves as the boat moves through the water, and then the little piece of electronics shows you, translates that into how fast you're going. So how many nautical miles per hour you're doing. Yeah, exactly. You can That's also do it because you, you can use these to measure distance on the chart. Yeah. And then you can time how long you go between set points on the chart. So you could time how long it took you to go between two of the boys that we yeah. looked at. Um, and then you could work it out. We could work it out from there as well. Right. A nautical mile isn't it a knot? Um, a nautical mile per hour or something? Is that right? So a knot is a measure of speed, and a nautical mile is a measure of distance. Yeah, but isn't it they're linked? Isn't a knot so many nautical miles per hour or something? How do you work it out? Isn't a knot just less? Isn't a nautical mile just less than a land mile, Jean? Yes. Yeah. And that, as I think, was Roger's. Roger's. Yeah. Um, yeah, one, or point was somewhere. translating a, a nautical mile to a land mile. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I've got to go to work. Thank right. you, Vanessa. I've got to go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.